Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning in. Cross and Crown Channel is about presenting powerful proof for the Christian faith. If you want to support Mike as he makes videos and writes books, just go to Mike's Patreon page at patreon.com backslash mrob and kick in a buck or so. If you join us over there, that would be awesome. Supporting this work will help bring countless people to Christ. If you like this video, there's a donation button on our main YouTube page. Thanks for hanging out. Good evening. This is Cross and Crown Radio and the Gospel Truth Podcast. I'm Mike Robinson, your host. We got an interesting show tonight. We're going to be talking about uh, that atheists actually do know that God exists. Hello, Felipe. It's so good to see you tonight. Hope things are going well. Greetings from Granberry here. We're also going to be talking about whether legalized weed is a good thing or whether it's bad. Should Christians support such actions? We see, uh, I think, about a third of the states now have it legal for recreational use. Is that a good thing? Then we're also going to be talking about the new purge. Hello, Robert. So good to have you. Hope things are going well over there. Hope you get your car situation together. Have Ted give me a call if you have a chance um, tomorrow or the next day. Give your bride a, a big hug for me also. And then the, so the third subject is going to be the purge that we've seen recently from Facebook. And we're going to talk about how that's going. If you have a chance, uh, go over to our Patreon page. There's a link here in the description on Facebook as well when it gets on YouTube. If you go over there, throw in a buck or five bucks, it really helps me out a lot. I could really use that help. Question of the day is, should Christians support legalized marijuana or not? So let's go to the main topic. Hello, Samuel. So good to see you, my friend. Greetings to you, too. All right, from India. Blessings to you, my friend. Um, do atheists really believe in God? Uh, researchers found that having atheists merely asking God to harm them or harm others gets them just as upset as it does believers. Isn't that interesting? They hook these folks up to a polygraph type of machine and then ask them questions. The researchers write that inclusion of sentences that dare God to do things that are bad and sentences that dare other agents that are not God to do bad things, the arousal only kicked in when the atheist asked God to do bad things. So notice that. It didn't matter who else they asked to do bad things. If they just wished it, nothing happened. No response as they're hooked up to this lie detector type of test, this polygraph type of test. But when they ask God, these atheists, to do bad things, dared God to do it, they reacted. Huh. See, atheists really do believe in God. How do we know that? Because Romans 1 says this, For since the creation of the world, his divine attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him. So atheists do know that God exists. All we need is God's word to know that. But it's also interesting to see this new science. I'm going to be talking about four different studies that demonstrate that atheists know that God exists. If you profess belief in God, you believe that God answers your prayers, and you would rightfully fear asking God, hello Calvin, asking God to do anything horrible to yourself or your family. But atheists say they don't believe in God, so it shouldn't affect them. Wrong. It does. It affects them greatly. No other agents that they asked to do bad things to them affected them on these polygraph tests, only if the atheist dared God to do it. In the academic work in the International Journal of the Psychology of Religion, atheists become emotionally aroused when daring God to do terrible things. Researchers ask the subjects to make horrifying statements, some statements like kicking puppies or their parents drowning, some dared God to do some awful stuff to their loved ones or to puppies or themselves. They had no reaction on the polygraph, neither did Christians unless they invoked God. Of the test subjects, about half were atheists and about half were Christians. Isn't that interesting? It's important to note that the study took place in Finland, which has a much higher proportion of atheists and agnostics in America. Yet America, of course, is the greatest country in the history of the world. It's not perfect by any stretch, but it's the greatest country by, by far, and it has a massive amount of Christians. That's no accident, right? 
But according to one estimate, most Finns say they do not believe in God. But as we'll see here, they actually do believe in God. They just say this. In one study, they had the test subject hooked up to this lie detector type of test, this polygraph type of test, and also believers. And they asked them what bothered them the most. And what bothered them was having God invoked in bringing harm to themselves or their parents. If they asked to have cancer upon themselves or for their parents to be killed, uh, the, the machine would react if they invoke God. If they did not invoke God, the atheists and the believers, nothing happened, nothing registered. So the idea was to find out if the atheists were lying because the atheists said it wouldn't affect them, yet it did. According to this polygraph type of test, the atheists found asking God to harm them or others to be just as upsetting as religious folk found it. Isn't that interesting? Let me say it again. According to this polygraph type of test, the atheist found asking God to harm them or to harm others that they loved was just as upsetting to them as it was to the believers from the registration of that polygraph test. The research also compared the reactions of atheists when making statements like, I wish my parents were paralyzed. Notice that not invoking God, no reaction on the polygraph test. But when they said, I dare God to paralyze my parents, it reacted. One statement without God and the other invoking God. Only the one invoking God did the atheist have a reaction on the polygraph type of machine. Atheists were, like believers, more bothered by the statement, I dare God to paralyze my parents than if they did not invoke God. Amazing. Yet they say, oh, I don't believe in God. And they, some of them really get angry about it, very aggressive. Why is that? Because they know God exists. They just hate God. They don't want to live with God. They want to reject God. And so they will be there uh, without God for eternity unless they repent. Now, even though both declarations would be, in theory, equally empty for the atheist, if there's no divine overseer, only the one with them invoking God registered. Those findings are evidence that atheists believe in God. The study reveals that the truth of God is extremely powerful, even in a secular society like Finland. This was not the atheists in America even. This was a so-called atheist in Finland. The truth of God is lodged deep in humanity's spirit. And so we know that. That's good news, Rad. I'm so glad to hear that, my friend. Hope to see you at church soon. We're praying for you. The researchers write that the inclusion of sentences that dare God to do bad things and sentences that dare other agents to do bad things, the arousal only came, was only linked to those daring God to do bad things. Another study primed both atheists and Christians with God-related words like spirit and divine. Then after they said they, these words, they had them complete a stress-inducing task also hooked up and measured, right? Those primed with God-based words were more persistent and were also more anxious whether they said they believed in God or not. They were equally anxious. Both were more anxious when invoking God, whether they were atheist or a believer. Another study, here's the third one. This is interesting. Hello, Steph, so good to see you. Hope things are going well. Greetings from Granbury. Another study found that the same priming method of mentioning God or something uh, religious, both atheists and believers were more generous towards strangers when reminded about God, even the atheists. So this is a tacit thing going on with the atheists because they're in the front of their mind saying, oh, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in God, yet they know God exists as Roman ones tells us. In an issue of the Journal of Religion and Brain Behavior that went over some of these studies, Several of the researchers grappled with the dilemma, what are atheists for when it's touching the survival of the human species? They said, and they concluded that the atheists might exist for, I quote, the promotion of the unity of religious communities that they berate. In other words, maybe atheists exist to be hated. I don't hate them. Christians don't hate them. Real Christians should not hate atheists. We should have compassion upon them. Hello, Pastor David Harris. Well, I really miss you, my friend. How's things? I think you're down there in Mississippi, right, my friend? We have to have compassion for them. We have to feel for them and actually really feel sorry for atheists because they know God exists. Now, in principle, in touching logic, 
and also ontology. You don't really need to know what that means yet. But in touching logic, in principle, there can be no real atheists. See, it's always difficult to defend atheism. In fact, it's impossible because you cannot prove that type of universal negative. You cannot prove it. Only God can prove that type of universal negative. And of course, that would mean God exists, right? So either way, you lose. Logically, there cannot be any true atheists. For one to propose that God does not exist anywhere at any time, one would have to know all things and be omnipresent, eternal, and infinite. That, of course, would make you God. So the only person in the universe who could possibly not believe in God everywhere and always would be God. And, of course, that doesn't make sense. One would have to be God to be a true atheist, and that is theoretically, logically, and rationally absurd. And Romans 1, as we read earlier, demonstrates that all people know that God exists. They know the God exists. But some atheists are really hardcore. You probably talked to some of them or, or, or maybe try to witness to them on social media. I've been blessed to be able to, over 30, 30 years, college campuses in the marketplace, witness to uh, atheists one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two, -on -two, uh, hundreds and hundreds of them, maybe thousands. And it's always been a blessing because immediately you see them usually stepping back and then declaring they're an agnostic as you discuss these things with them. And then some of them get saved. But all of them that I've talked to, you could tell they know that God exists. So Romans 1 tells us that scientific research has demonstrated that. And in my uh, dealing with atheists online as well as in person, you can tell they know God exists. They just hate God. And they should just say that. Hey, I know God exists, but I just don't like him. Okay? And then you pray for them that way. It, you know, it's, it's kind of like this. How do atheists get so aggressive and really, uh, you know, are vehemently denying that they know that God exists, yet they do know God exists? How does that work? It's kind of like the misogynist who says, oh, I, I don't hate women. But every time he's walking down the street and there's a woman on the sidewalk, he crosses the street to avoid her. Oh, I don't hate women. I don't hate women. But his actions betray that. Every time there's a woman announcer on his radio, he changes the channel. Well, I don't hate women. I don't hate women, right? When he gets on the bus and a, a woman sits next to him, he gets up and changes seats. Well, I don't hate women. I don't. But his actions betray that. Whenever he sees a female on TV, he has to change the channel. Well, I don't hate women. But see, his actions betray what he really, really believes. What he knows is true. He hates women. Atheists are very similar. They use God's logic while they deny God. They rest upon God's moral truths as they deny God. They look at God's perfect design in the world and they deny God. They know God exists, yet they just want to argue and get mad, even though they know that God must exist. Hello, Vicki. So good to see you tonight. So this again is what Romans 1 says. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. We know that. Hello, Mark. So good to see you again, my friend. Notice that, clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse because although they knew God, did you catch that? They did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And that's what you see when you talk to an atheist. Does that mean you should lash out the, at them and get angry at them, even if they're angry at you and be mean back to them? No. Yes, there's a place to be have a robust uh, uh, proof for God, to, to push back in, in a sense of being firm and understanding and yet patient, because that's a fruit of the Spirit, peace and patience, right? And loving, right? So we do that. We have to utilize all the fruit of the Spirit as we discuss these issues with atheists and understand that they do know that God exists. So that there's a problem there. It's a sin problem. John Frame, he said it this way. The unbeliever knows enough truths about God to be without excuse and may know many more. He goes on to say, unbelievers lack the obedience and the friendship with God that is essential in knowledge in its fullest biblical sense, the knowledge of the believer. So those in the covenant community, those who've been born again, we know God as father. We know God, Jesus as friend. So there is a distinction. 
Yet the atheists, even though they hate God, they're not within the covenant and the promises. They're not born again. They're not regenerated. They do know rationally that God exists. In fact, that God must exist. Hello, Dennis. So good to have you tonight. See, no one has enough blind faith. I know this. I've talked to folks all the time. I've written over 40 books on many of these issues. Hello, Lance. No one has enough blind faith to believe that order came from disorder. Uniformity came from the accidental. Intelligence came from non-intelligence. Nobody has enough blind faith to believe that, like atheists say they do, that design came from chaos, that personality came from non-personality, that love came from hard matter. No one has enough blind faith to believe that, even if the atheists try to say that. Nobody can believe that everything came from nothing. They can't. And that's why that research that I talked about earlier is so amazing. Five different studies hooked up atheists and believers with a lie detector type of test, a polygraph type of instrument, and asked them questions. Asked them to dare a God to do certain bad things to themselves or their family. They also asked them to just wish those things to happen or to have some other entity that wasn't God to do those things to their family or to themselves. No reaction on the polygraph test from the atheists when they just wish for these harmful things to happen to them or their loved ones. No reaction. No reaction when they asked other agents that were not God for something to happen to themselves or their family members in a bad way. Nothing happened when they were on the polygraph type of test. But when they dared God to bring harm upon themselves or their loved ones, they reacted in the same exact way that the Christians did when they were hooked up to the same polygraph type of instrument. It was the only one that drew a reaction, the only one that drew a response, a major response from the atheist who try to deny that they believe in God, they know God exists, they, don't ju they just don't trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, they don't have a friendship with God, and they're not within the covenant community, they're not regenerated, they're not justified, but intellectually, they know God exists. It's kind of like this. You know, the, the little uh, brat kid, that's, let's call him Georgie. Okay, little Georgie is just a really rotten kid. There are some rotten kids out there. Uh, some parents aren't doing the greatest job, right? So little Georgie, is, is a bad kid. Everybody knows he's a bad kid. So he's at school and he gets in trouble disrupting the class again, not listening to the teacher and cussing at the teacher and such, right? So the teacher calls little Georgie's uh, mom and says, uh, little Georgie was disrupting class again. The mom said, oh no, little Georgie would never do that. You're just persecuting my son. I do not believe little Georgie would ever, ever do that. And so the, the next day, Georgie's back at school and he, he does something else wrong. So the teacher sends him to the principal's office. He cusses out the principal. Principal calls little Georgie's mom and says, little Georgie just cussed me out. We, we got to suspend him. And she goes, oh, no, little Georgie would never do that. You guys just have something against my little Georgie. He's a wonderful, he's a great kid. So to reward little Georgie for his bad behavior, his mother allows him to spend the night at his best friend's house. So he spends the night at his best friend's house, little Georgie. And he gets caught stealing money out of little uh, out of his friend's mother's purse. He steals money out of her purse. So the mother of his friend calls little Georgie's mom and says, you know, I caught your son, little Georgie, stealing out of my purse. And the mother said, oh, no, little Georgie would never do that. You guys are just framing him. I'm going to go pick up little Georgie right now. So she goes and picks up little Georgie, all the while saying, little Georgie's a great kid. He's a wonderful kid, right? Doing it with great uh, passion. Great zeal saying Georgie's a great kid. Yet when she brings Georgie back home, she locks her liquor cabinet and hides her purse. So she knows little Georgie's not a good kid. Yet everything she says is defending him and saying, no, he's a good kid. That's how atheists are with their atheism. They know that God exists. They just don't like him. So they keep saying, oh no, God doesn't exist. God doesn't exist. God, there is no proof. There is no proof. When there's massive proof and everybody's given them the massive proof. Plus they just have to open their eyes to see all the proof. Hello, Chauncey. So good to see you, my friend. So the proof is all around them, right? Hey, Lance, you still out there in Las Vegas, my friend? So good to see you. Um, it's, it's just the way the mindset works, that they have a knowledge of God, as Romans uh, 1 says, they know God exists, they hate him. Charles Krauthammer, I think he died last year. He was a fairly brilliant guy for a, a secular type. He, he called himself an agnostic. But this is what he said about atheism. Now, this is not a Christian. He says, I believe that atheism is the least plausible. Well, there are a lot of wild ones out there, but atheism is so contrary to what is possible. What, the universe created itself ex nihilo? 
Atheism. Talk about a violation of human reason. Atheism is off the charts. <laughs> That's what Krauthammer said. So, now, if you think that there's a little problem, let's just let atheists lie and don't, and don't witness to them. Who cares about them? No, we need to care about them. We need to witness to them. We need to demonstrate the truth of the Christian worldview to them. We need to call them to repentance by demonstrating we all sin through the law and then give them a chance with the gospel that God's grace would touch their heart through his word and spirit. This is what we need to do. Why? Because listen to what Sam Harrison, one of the most famous new atheists, this is what he said. Some propositions are so dangerous that it may be ethical to kill people for believing them. And he's talking about religion. That's your Mr. Mild Manner, new atheist. Bill Maher said this, God is psychotic mass murder. That's what Bill Maher said. Wow. So do Dawkins and his allies help promote a climate of hate? Yes. They call religious people mentally ill, even though obviously in a sense you can tell they are. They're deluded. They're loons when they know that God exists yet they're fighting against him, right? They know it. Sam Harris said, selected religionists should be killed for religious belief. That's horrible. Absolutely horrible. This is what uh, the atheist Sam Harris also said. He said, if I could wave a magic wand and get rid of either rape or religion, I would not hesitate to get rid of religion. That's what the atheist Sam Harris said. That's horrible. That's absolutely horrible. Taking a page out of Stalin's atheistic playbook. Remember, Stalin was an atheist who killed 30 to 60 million people in the name of atheistic communism. He rounded up ministers and priests, closed churches uh, uh, by the mass, thousands and thousands, because he's an atheist. He was an atheist. He hated God. Some of the new atheists seek to brainwash believers through deprogramming them. That's what they want to do. They're obsessed with with Christianity because they know it's the truth. They know Jesus is the truth. See, this is what we are dealing with. This is why we need to understand the truth of Christianity, the power of Christianity, the power and the glory of Christianity. You need to know it. You need to teach your kids uh, what the truth of Christianity is, why you believe. Your children need to have an anchor on Christianity emotionally, spiritually, and intellectually. Emotionally, the way I raised my kids was for them to be anchored upon Jesus. Nobody's like Jesus. Jesus is winsome and marvelous. I want them to be anchored emotionally upon Jesus. So when things go bad, emotionally they're attached to Jesus. But if their emotions go out of flux, right? What do we want? We want a spiritual anchor also. What we want there is for them to understand the power of the word and prayer and worship. So they need to be uh, hooked up to God emotionally and spiritually and intellectually when those other two seem to be failing a little bit when you give them rock hard proof and certain evidence for the existence of God and the truth of Jesus that will hold them when all their friends want to take them here or there when their emotions want to flow this way they have that intellectual thought whoa wait a minute this is not just one other religion this is not just one other option Christianity is absolutely true I am stuck, right? Even if they emotionally don't want to be there, they're stuck. And that's what you want. You need those three pillars and you do that. And like I've mentioned before, I did that at the dinner table every single night. As we're eating dinner, I ask my children those three type of questions. Something to do with emotional when it comes to Jesus, something to do with the spiritual and something to do with intellectual reasons that they saw during their school day, why they know God exists. And it's only maybe five, 10 minutes of that. Every night, just a little a snippet, one or two minutes each kid, because I had four kids. But over weeks and months and years, it builds a huge base that helps them resist all the crazy nonsense that's out there. All four of my kids are now young adults, and they've all avoided all the lunacy of the crazy stuff that goes on in society. And one of the biggest reasons is because of what I just told you. Okay, well, you're a pastor, you've written 40 books, I can never, you could get some of my books, watch some of the videos. Again, you're not talking, give your kids a 60 minute lecture every night on apologetics. You're talking uh, two or three minutes each child about what they saw in their, in their day that demonstrated that God exists. It could be something in biology and math, walking home from school, the wind, the rain. You just need to know how to bring them to understand that. I started my kids when they were toddlers. 
And so I had to kind of walk them through that, baby step them through it every time until they got stronger and stronger in it. That's what you need to do. Why do I believe in Christianity? Because of God's grace. Through his word and spirit, he changed my heart. I'm born again. That's number one. Next, because the Bible, massive proof. The archaeological proof of the Bible is incredible. They used to say and mock the Bible. Well, there's no evidence for Pilate until 1961. Boom, that one's over. Well, there's no, there's no evidence for Nazareth. Boom, in the 20th century, we found evidence for the town of Nazareth. Well, there's no evidence for King David, so the, the Old Testament is just a myth. Boom, in the 1990s, evidence for King David. Isn't that amazing? Hittites, there's no evidence for the Hittites. Early 20th century, boom, it was found. Hello, Mike, so good to have you tonight. Time after time after time, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of places where the skeptics said the Bible has no evidence for something. Archaeology, boom, finds something. Even in the 20th and the 21st century, we see that. You get more in my book on Exodus, God is the King on Amazon if you want to get more on archaeology and so forth. So why, am I, why do I believe in Christianity? Because of God is grace, I'm born again. Number two, because of the massive proof for the Bible, including archaeology. Also, the predictions about Jesus, the proof for who Jesus is. All the other claimants of all the other religions, worldviews, and philosophies come on the stage and they say, look, believe me. Why? Well, because I say so. And maybe I have this book. Maybe I have this, this building here, so follow me. No, that's not good enough. Jesus said, you know what? I am the way, the truth, and life. And you can check out all the predictions in the Old Testament. He says this in Luke 24. Read the Old Testament. And you'll see in Moses, in the Psalms, and the writings, all the predictions about his life. Where he would be born, where he would live in Nazareth, what he would do as an adult, the day he would come into uh, uh, Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, how he would die, all the things to do with his trial, his arrest, and his execution, all those things. Hundreds of different predictions about Jesus. They all came true in one guy. So why do I believe in Christianity? Because I'm born again. And number two, because of the massive proof for the Bible. Three, including the proof for Jesus and the 300 prophecies about his life. And also the proof of the resurrection. The proof of the resurrection is astounding. Get my videos on that on Cross and Crown Radio on YouTube if you want to see more. Or my book I wrote called Risen. I'm not going to cover it tonight. The proof for the resurrection is massive. It's amazing. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good one, uh, Chauncey. That dinner table is so important. That's what I would encourage and what I what I would disciple young people in when they have children is to disciple your kids. Your kids have to be anchored upon the truth of Christianity spiritually, emotionally, and intellectually. A lot of us are very, very emotional. So that's how we anchor our kids, just on the emotional. But then they have an emotional problem and they leave Christianity. Some of us are very, very spiritual, we think, right? And so we anchor our kids just on the spiritual aspects of the faith. And those are true and powerful. But you know what? Then they have a problem intellectually and they leave the faith. You have to do all three as well as intellectual. Number three, the intellectual, you got to anchor them with all the proof of Christianity. It's not the most important. It's not the only thing, but it's a big part of the whole package. Emotional, spiritual, and intellectual. Do that. You'll see your kids or your grandkids or your, your young people in your life and your church be really strong in the faith. The next reason why I'm a, a, a Christian is because of the cross. There's no other religion that gives me an eternal atonement. Jesus did that on the cross. Flowing from that, another reason I'm a Christian is justification. No religion in the entire world, except for Christianity, gives me justification. My sins washed away and the righteousness of Christ imputed to me. You can't get that anywhere else. Justification, I'm declared righteous. Next, the reason I'm a Christian is because the Bible declares what sin is, that every human being would sin. What a, what a prediction. And it's so true, and everybody admits it's true. You would think, well, maybe only half the population sins, or maybe 90% uh, of them do. Or maybe there's a few that won't, right? The Bible says everyone sins, and we've seen that. What a great prediction. Next, the proof for the universe. We know that a design requires a designer. Next reason why I know that God must exist is because of DNA. It's a language. 
It's a code, DNA code, code. Hello here, this is not rocket science. If you got a, a DNA code, there's gotta be a code giver. There's no code anywhere on the planet that isn't given by an intelligence, right? Logic, the laws of logic, including the law of non-contradiction, the law of identity, those two things, as well as other things like mathematical truths, geometrical truths, moral absolutes, all those things are what are called universal immutables which means that they have universal placement and they're immutable, they never change. The physical cosmos always changes and everything within it. So nothing in the physical cosmos could be the foundation for universal immutables, including the laws of logic, law of non-contradiction, law of identity. God, who has universal reach and power and is immutable, he has a capacity to account for these things. That's powerful. And of course, the main reason I'm a Christian is because of Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> Nobody's like him. Come on, think about that. Here's a guy with all the proof, right? All the predictions. He's the guy who died on the cross for our sins. He's the one that rose again on the third day. And yet, he's also the same son of man who spoke like no one ever spoke before. He's the same guy who loved like nobody else loved before. He's the same one who did miracles that nobody else did before. All this in one man, the Son of Man, the great I Am who came, manifested in the flesh, Jesus Christ. Amazing. He parted B.C. into A.D. All this in one God. You can't say that about anybody else in the entire history of the world. Put them all together and nobody spoke like Jesus. Put them all together and nobody loved like Jesus. Put them all together and nobody had the proof that Jesus had. And only Jesus died on the cross for our sins and only God raised Jesus from the dead. Buddha's still on the ground. David Crush is still on the ground. Reverend Moon is still on the ground. Jesus is alive. So we know that nobody has enough blind faith to believe that order came from disorder. Uniformity came from the accidental. Intelligence came from non-intelligence. Design came from chaos. Nobody has enough blind faith to believe that. That personality came from non-personality. That love came from hard matter. And that everything came from nothing. Nobody has enough blind faith to believe that. But Christian theism has rock solid, absolute certainty about it. You have full certitude. There's not a, an ounce of doubt. Why is that the case? There's not an ounce of doubt that Christianity must be true. I'll tell you one reason. There's multiple reasons. Here's one reason. Doubt requires the God of the Bible. You say, what do you mean? I'm, if I'm doubting God, how does that require God? Because while you're doubting God, whoa, man, I wonder if God exists. I read this book or I saw this video or I'm going through certain things or somebody I love died or, or something happened and so I'm doubting God. While you're doubting God, you're using your reason and your rationality to doubt him. Oh, I wonder if he really exists. I wonder if he's really there. While you're doing that, you're using again those universal immutables that only God can be the foundation for. So even your doubt requires God. I didn't give you a great long exposition on that. You can get that also on Cross and Crown on YouTube, How Doubt Requires God. You can get that. You can also get it in my book, Science Requires God, on Amazon by Mike Robinson. Science Requires God. So Christian theism delivers the ontic ground for the uh, pre-environment for immutable universals utilized in all rational inquiry. In principle, materialistic atheism cannot furnish that ground. It's impossible. In principle, it's absolutely impossible. What is necessary to account for analysis of anything? The analysis of whether God exists or he doesn't exist. What has to be in place is God. Only God has the ontological endowment to ground those universal mutables that are even used in questioning whether God exists or not. The loss of universal immovable point of reference in principle leaves the atheist, the ungodly, bereft of a resource necessary to construct any enterprise that has to do with reason or rationality. Without God, one cannot hoist the necessary a priori operational features for the intellectual examination of the evidence of anything, whether it's God, the Bible, or just a flower. God must exist for you even to have that analytical enterprise occurring. The Christian worldview supplies a fixed ontic platform as a sufficient truth condition that justifies induction, immutable universals, attributes, identity, the uniformity of the physical world. 
but materialistic atheism lacks such a fixed ontic platform. Consequently, it fails to provide the sufficient ground required to justify inquiry and research touching on anything. When anyone attempts to escape the truth that God exists, he falls in the trap he cannot escape. This is a point well made in Van Til's famous illustration of a man made of water who's trying to climb out of a watery ocean by the means of a ladder made of water. He cannot get out of the water for he has nothing to stand on. And without God, one cannot make sense of anything because he has nothing to stand on. God is the only foundation which someone can stand on to analyze anything, to use his reason in touching anything. The evidence of Christian theism is not just overwhelming, it's certain. You can have perfect, logical certainty that the God of the Bible exists. You can have full spiritual certitude that the God of the Bible exists. You can have complete emotional certainty that God exists. And that's found in Jesus, and it's found in the proof that I've given already. Christian theism furnishes these universal functioning features. Atheism, in principle, fails. Atheism or Christianity. Atheism cannot supply these necessary universal immutables. Christianity does. Christianity must be true. And that's wonderful. The Bible says that Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving, proving that Jesus is the Christ. One way Paul did that was the 300 predictions about Jesus we talked about earlier. The Bible foretold the events and the historical details about the coming of Jesus prior to his birth. And we have the documents in the Dead Sea Scrolls dated 100 years before Christ came. We can date the ink, we can date the paper. We know the writing and we know the Aramaic within the Dead Sea Scrolls has a small amount of Aramaic in it and has a lot of Hebrew. And we can date that 100 years before Christ came. Within the Dead Sea Scrolls is every single book in the Old Testament except for one, the book of Esther. Within those Old Testament books have the same predictions and prophecies about Jesus coming and they all came true. All these predictions came true in the birth and the life and the death and resurrection of Jesus. And there's no other religious leader ever had hundreds of predictions about their life written before they came, documented before they came. Jesus did. No other spiritual leader or prophet had predictive material written about their lives recorded before they were born. Jesus Christ had more than 300 predictions about his life that were fulfilled in exact detail. An agent on the X-Files once said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And the reason God could predict the future is because he invented it. He made the future just like he made the past and the present. <coughs> he is sovereign. Only one with extreme power like God has to perfectly prearrange history could create a future that one man could fulfill 300 prophecies and predictions about the life most of which were out of the control of Jesus to self-fulfill. Jesus said to them in Luke 24, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Over 300 of them. Christ's virgin birth was predicted 700 years before he was born in Isaiah chapter 7. Micah 5, 2, hundreds of years before Jesus came, predicted that he would be born in Bethlehem. Now, these predictions, the rabbis before Jesus came, before he was born, in sections of the Talmud and the Targums, they say that these prophecies were going to be about the Messiah. So it wasn't just a Christian invention. The rabbis before Christ came also asserted that these would be the, the Messiah. After Christ fulfilled them, a lot of the rabbis tried to backtrack from that, especially the modern ones, but before Christ came, we have the documents that tell us that they thought these prophecies were about the Messiah. Psalm 22 predicted the crucifixion of Jesus before that form of execution was even invented by King David, 1000 BC. And it says this, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are spread out. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. You have brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have encircled me, the band of spoilers have hemmed me in, they've pierced my hands and my feet. They've pierced my hands and my feet, written a thousand years before Christ came. If you want to get more, you can help me out by buying the book, God Does Exist, by Mike Robinson on Amazon, or you can get 
Jesus Saving Lord, also by me, or Science Requires God. If you get those books, it really, really helps out a lot. Now, next subject, uh, should marijuana be legalized? I'm quoting from this week's Wall Street Journal articles called Weeding Out Dubious Marijuana Science. There's a lot of bad science out there trying to advocate the use of marijuana for those who don't need it medically. It says this, driving deaths have risen more than 30% in Colorado and Washington, the first states to legalize marijuana for recreational use. Uh, deaths went up about 15% across the country, but 30% in Colorado and Washington, the first states to legalize recreational use of marijuana. That's interesting. Violent crime has also soared in the legalized states since 2013. Isn't that interesting? Now, you have to be concerned as a Christian for pharmakia, right? Which is the word for sorcery in the book of Revelation. It's also the word where we get pharmacy from. So you got to be careful with what you ingest and what it does to you. What state does it put you in? I do believe that some medical concerns, uh, medical marijuana is good. I'm a certified nutritionist and I see that. But the question of the night is, do you as a Christian think that marijuana should be legalized or not? Should marijuana be legalized or not? Now, hopefully, you know, the things I discussed tonight won't get me banned. But I do know that social media has really pushed down a lot of my social media imprint whenever I talk about certain religious groups. You're not allowed to. Anytime I talk about trans issues or, or uh, issues from the gay lifestyle, boy, I get in big trouble. Get warnings, get flags, had some videos taken off, right? Uh, U.S. News in the Wall Street Journal this week said, just a few days ago, Facebook bans more dangerous users. <laughs> dangerous. See, I think dangerous is something that has to do with physical violence, you know, which is, is, is completely unacceptable. Physical violence can't, it's not acceptable. Inciting physical violence, I don't think it's acceptable. But free speech should be free speech, but these social media groups don't believe in free speech. We have to do something about this. I hear you, Vicki. I hear you. Thanks, Mike. So, these purges that are going on. Now, I'm going to read this article, but I can't read the names. Because as I'll read the quote from Facebook, they say if you even mention these names or have anything to do with these people that they banned, you can be banned. Not by saying anything that they think is deemed hateful, but just by mentioning these people's names. So let me read a few highlights from this article. Facebook bans dangerous users. Dangerous users. None of these people, except for maybe one of them that I know of, and it was a joke, not, it was a good joke, incited physical violence, right? Or asked for physical violence. None of them. Hello, Mark, so good to have you. But I can't read their names, or I could be banned. And, and as you hear this article, you'll see it'll only take me a couple minutes. It says that Facebook includes people or groups that have been called or carried out acts of violence. That's understandable. Ban those people if they carried out acts of violence. Or use hate speech or slurs in their descriptions or follow a hateful ideology. Now notice that. That hate speech, right? What is the definition of that? The definition for most liberal groups is anything that you say goes against my ideology. We know that the social media platforms are strongly leftist leaning, uh, very strong libs and progressives, even very strong leftists in some areas, right? In all the social media platforms, pretty much all the big ones. So their hate speech, what they deem hate speech could be anything against their progressive worldview which just seems what they really hold to, right? So I'll read that again. Any use of hate speech or slurs or hateful ideology and you can be banned. Now, they can say anything. Is that right? 
Individuals that were banned on Thursday included, I can't give their names. Let's see, right here is the one, two, three, four, five big names I can't mention. If I mention, I, I can get banned. Uh, one of them said, well, I probably can't even quote his quote in defending himself. Sorry about that. I, I don't think I can even quote that. So they do have the responses from some of these folks that got banned. Folks I can't name or I could get banned. I don't think I could even quote them or I could get banned. And I got too much good work to do about uh, defending the Christian faith and seeing people get saved to die on a hill protecting these people. I think they need to be protected. I think free speech needs to be protected. I don't know how to do that right now. I really don't. I think Christians should have their own social media groups. If the country claims to be about 40% born again Christians, I know you can say, well, you know, so many of them aren't really born again. Well, if they claim to be born again, and they're, they're advocating that type of worldview, if we all got together and had our own type of Twitter, had our own type of Facebook, had our own type of YouTube, I know there's a few small versions of those. We need to find a way to support that and make that kind of thing grow. We don't need to be into this leftist nightmare. Again, I can't, I can't quote most of this article because it's quotes from the people that got banned, right? And I'll tell you why I can't, do, uh, I can't quote that. This is what um, Media Matters, which is a very liberal group that uh, obviously advocates uh, for progressive values uh, to Facebook so that Facebook would remove these people. This is what they said. Speaking about the people that got banned, this is what the liberal group said. They used their accounts to dehumanize entire communities, promoted hateful conspiracy theories, radicalized audience, all the while they profited from directing people to their own websites. So this liberal group doesn't want free speech. They want these people banned. So they advocated for that, and we see Facebook ban them. Yeah, they're really cracking down, Lance. If you have any other examples, list them if you have a chance, my friend. It's really, really sad. We need to really, really pray about starting our own. You know, when you think about Chick-fil-A, the owners there are Christians. They got billions of dollars. Hobby Lobby, they got billions of dollars. I know it's easy for me to tell people how to spend their money. But there are certain Christian um, CEOs and owners of huge corporations that could really put their money and their time behind a social media platform and advocate to all the churches like Mel Gibson did with his movie Passion, right? The leftist media hated the movie Passion, would not promote it at all. So Mel Gibson went to all the churches. And at that time, it was one of the top 10 highest grossing movies in history because he went to all the churches and the churches supported it, right? Yeah, censoring speech, you're right. It is crazy. Now, this liberal group goes on to say, today's announcement opens the doors to making Facebook's platform safer. Who said it has to be safer speech-wise? Yes, physical. We don't want physical harm on anybody. Christians, we advocate peace and love. But there has to be free speech, even if you disagree with it, as long as it's not calling down physical harm on anybody or trying to incite that type of violence. But hate speech, whatever they want to deem that, slurs, hateful ideology, whatever leftists deem that, they want that? Would they want um, uh, right-wingers deeming their speech hate speech and to be banned? Today's announcement, this liberal group says, opens the doors for making Facebook's platform safer, inspiring some optimism that the tech company might be capable, capable of taking responsibility for the way it platforms have empowered extremists. Wow. So, yes, the truth is leftists don't want free speech. They only want speech that lines up with their ideology. That's it. If you don't have leftist ideology, they don't want to hear it. You cannot say it. If you de disagree with some of the, the lifestyles that they advocate, you're a hater. And you, can't, you cannot be allowed to be on a platform. Then this is what Facebook said. Listen to this. This is why I could not name the names of the people that got banned I cannot name them on most social media platforms. I cannot quote from them on most social media platforms. Isn't that obscene? Can't even quote, can't name them. That person doesn't exist. Doesn't that sound like Soviet Russia? Stalin would get rid of somebody 
and nobody in Stalin's court could bring that guy's name up again. He just disappeared and we never heard of him. He just went away, he's gone, and that's it. Listen to what Facebook said. When it banned people under these policies in the past, it has also prohibited other users from praising. Did you catch that? This is what the Wall Street Journal says Facebook said. Facebook prohibited other users from praising or supporting the banned individuals on its sites, even if the praise is unrelated to the hateful or violent conduct. Wow. You can't mention their names. I mean, it's bad. It's really bad to ban people over speech if it's not inciting violence, right? It's really, really bad. But you can't even name them. You can't quote them. Wow. Facebook said it would remove pages, groups, and accounts set up to represent the people banned on Thursday. Anybody says anything about these people that got banned, you could be banned. You know, well, uh, Vicky, you might uh, be having a problem with that, uh, mentioning that person's name. If I was you, I would unfortunately erase that uh, comment. Sorry to see, I, I'm not saying you have to on my account. I'm not going to, I'm not going to limit speech. But just so you know, Facebook is watching. They watch my account really close because I have so many videos that refute false religions and false worldviews. And I get in the trans issues so be careful i don't want you to be paranoid but you know let me read this again this is a wall street journal okay wall street journal friday this is what they said again this is chilling this is absolutely chilling listen to this facebook said that when it has banned people under these policies in the past it has also prohibited other users from praising or supporting the banned individuals on its site, even if the praise is unrelated to the hateful or violent conduct. Wow. Wow. You better not have a relative with one of these people's names, right? And say anything. This is, this is extreme. This is Stalinistic. Facebook said it would remove pages, groups, and accounts set up to represent the people banned Thursday. It also said it would remove events on Facebook when it knows one of the individuals is participating. Wall Street Journal. Amazing. We got a lot of work cut out for us. We need the gospel going out. We need hearts changed. Christians believe in free speech of anybody, as long as it's not calling down uh, physical harm on anybody or inciting such. We don't mind if this leftist has this view or this person has that view or this religion has that view share it all you want we know truth will win out the light always dispels the darkness so what does darkness have to do it has to shut down the light it cannot have the light on because it will dispel its darkness this is really really sad please 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 pray that some of these giant ceo christian organizations would take some of their billions of dollars and start a massive social media platform and, and redo a Twitter and a Facebook and a YouTube. Because pretty soon, Christians are going to be completely banned unless you can say, I believe with all, I believe all the leftist nonsense. It's very, very sad. Well, hopefully this is Pastor Mike Robinson, not the last time speaking. But we told you the gospel earlier that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and rose again. If you don't know Jesus and the word and the spirit is tugging on your heart and you feel, you know, I really want Jesus. It doesn't matter if you were an atheist, a Hindu or whatever. Don't throw all that away. Be done with that and come to Christ tonight. What you do is you just profess what you believe, what you heard in the word and spirit. You say something like this, Father, I believe, I believe in Jesus. I believe he's a son of God. I believe he died on the cross for all my sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. This I believe. I turn from all my ways, and I turn to Christ. I give him my whole heart and my whole life. I'll follow him all my days. In Jesus' name. If, that, if you did that, get a Bible right now. Get one on your phone. Apps are free. Lots of them. 
get an app on your phone right now, a Bible app. Also get one on your computer if you use a computer. We'll send you a hardcover Bible if you want one free. We'll pay the postage. Also, any two of my 45 books that I've written, if you just got saved recently, it doesn't have to be through this program, and you want one of my, or two of my books, any two you want, they're on Amazon by Mike Robinson. My most famous one used in seminaries and Bible colleges, God Does Exist, also wrote a recent book called Science Requires God, really good seller. You might want to check that. Also wrote a book, Who Made Truth, which is for kids, children. Helps them with apologetics. It's written for children. A lot of adults take that because it talks about really lofty uh, concepts in a sense for children to understand. So it's a good way for you to break into ontology, logic, and certain areas of Christian theology through that. But this is Pastor Mike Robinson. Until next time, saying may God richly bless you. And Vicki, I do agree with you about Ted Cruz. He seems to stand up for a lot of really powerful things strong Christian, pray for him and pray for the Christians that are in government positions. But until Thursday, may God richly bless you. Hey guys, you can really help us if you donate to our worldwide media outreach. Just go to our Patreon page at Mike Robinson Apologetics on Patreon or click the donate button on our main page on YouTube and give as the Lord leads. Thank you so much.